Hello, I walked into Jason Cabot's experience. I guess for the, the second or third time, it's Christina Brennan. Christina, we got a lot of catch up on. We do, we do. So last time we met or we talked, you've had like a little career pivot, right? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. It's small. So what are you, you doing now? I am a stand-up comedian now. And Mostly so full-time. <laughs> how'd that come about? Like, was something you always wanted to do or? Kind of. I remember about 10 years ago it's been. 10 years ago when I lived in Texas, um, one of my co-workers at Texas Roadhouse uh, was a stand-up, or is a stand-up comedian still, Roxy, and um, she she had brought me out to a comedy show, and I was hanging out with some of the comedians afterwards, and they're like, you're pretty funny, you should try stand-up, you know, like, women should, you know, we need more women doing comedy, blah, 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 and I'm like, not me, not little old me, like, I'm just funny in conversation, like, I couldn't be a performer. You know, at the time I was doing a lot of event planning and like strategy work and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm a behind the scenes person. I lift people up. I book the people. You know, I'm not the talent. I book the talent, um, which is funny because I'm a Leo. So that whatever self-doubt and all of that that was going on is kind of funny to look back on and be like, yeah, I didn't want to be on stage. OK. Um, and then I kind of always had that in the back of my head and I'd write down little joke ideas and stuff. and. I'm still trying to find those notebooks uh, in storage <laughs> one of these days. Hopefully I'll find them. But um, yeah, just kind of something in the back of my mind for a long time. And then when I got to Seattle and I was doing more public speaking work and helping people with their pitches and different things like that. Um, when I started, you know, helping more people with like public speaking and stuff like that, that's when I was really like, you know, what, maybe I could do stand up. And so then for like years, and I remember like doing like my 2020 goals and being like, all right, I'm going to go to an open mic this year, try stand up comedy for the first time. And then COVID hit. Um, and then, you know, everybody was going through changes and like, you know, analyzing things and whatnot, I think. And I don't know, I, I ended up moving back to Colorado and it was right around my birthday where I decided, I was like, you know what, there's this open mic the night before my birthday and that's what I'm going to do for my birthday <laughs> is get my friends and family to come watch me embarrass myself in front of a room of like 40 people. So how do y'all get paid? Like obviously if you're Dave Chappelle, you make millions of dollars, but I always hear like you're like an up and coming uh, comedian. You have to like, you have to, you have to pay the club some money to actually go on stage and stuff like that. Like how do you actually make money? It's a yeah, it's a wide range. There's pay to play for sure. Like I just did a contest and contests usually have prize money and theoretically that's where the money comes from is, you know, I pay twenty dollars to perform. So there's some pay to play stuff. There's a lot of stuff um in like New York and LA like that too that are just regular open mics and just because there's so many people, so it's a way to filter out. And they'll be like five bucks or something. I don't know. I haven't been to New York or LA yet. So there's that side of it where you actually have to pay to perform and then when you think about the costs um even when you do get paid when you're new it can be i've been paid like ten dollars i've been paid in food i've been paid in nothing i've been, i'm waiting actually for a venmo payment from a show from two weeks ago um so it's it's a wide range um generally speaking when you're new you're probably making like three to five dollars a minute and you're probably doing seven to 15 minutes at a time i've now kind of upgraded a little bit i'm doing 20 minute 15 and 20 minute feature sets so i'm going up before the headliner um still doing showcases and stuff i'm still in the range though where i'll do anything pretty much still do the roast battles still do all the random so when you when you go off stage like how quickly do you know okay i'm like really i'm, I'm doing really good oh man i shouldn't even i might be bombing right now like how how do you know that shit? <laughs> that's like, funny um i don't know like it's it could change real quick. It's like anything like it could be going really well at the beginning and then not so much. I try to get a feel for what the audience is laughing at, um, at other people's jokes and try to take that into consideration sometimes. But ultimately, like you got to get, you know, you got to do your thing. And so, uh, bombing i haven't i haven't had that true experience where nobody's laughing or like people are booing me or trying to get me off stage i've had a couple like hecklers but i've never had like a crowd turn on me yet so i don't really know what that feels like but i'm sure it'll happen one of these days um i've definitely had individuals not be so happy with me so how do you handle hecklers you, you don't need you probably put them in, put them in their place yeah that's kind of 
that's how it goes. And it's funny because I'm a nice person. You're very really nice. Am. Yeah. So nice. And so the shadow side of that is a little bit mean. Um, yeah, I don't know. It it just depends. I've like the one that's coming to mind right now, like I hate the response that came up. I feel like I just gave like the most like low hanging fruit kind of thing. Cause this dude was like, You suck. And I was like, Yeah, I suck a lot of dick. And yeah. it's like Okay, everybody laughed and yeah. I had the room on my side yeah. and he ended up leaving and mm-hmm. that was corny as hell. Like and I was pretty new, so I was like, All right. Yeah. I won, but like the next day I'm like, Okay, these are this is what I would have said, right? Yeah. Um, and so I kinda have like responses in my back yeah. pockets because I know which jokes are gonna yeah. rub people the wrong way. It's yeah. political stuff usually and See, so yeah, I always thought you would have said like, Yeah, I suck a lot a lot of dick, but never yours. It's getting too personal. They don't even want him to think about that. We're not paying no kind of pictures like that. Um, yeah, this other lady, I let her interrupt me like four times. I was like, okay, uh huh. And then she said something, and I just had to kind of go in on her. But yeah. she didn't interrupt me the rest of the set. And why, I don't understand why people do that. Like, you paid money to see these comedians. Why do you heckle? I never understood that. That's, that's, yeah, that's real. In those situations, those are both open mics where they did not pay. And, People are drunk and you yeah. know, people be drunk. That's that's yeah. a big part yeah. of it. They get that liquid courage. Um, and for some reason, because there's a like a with us being up on the stage and stuff, there's this expectation that we're gonna keep our composure to a certain extent. So that there's like it's almost like the keyboard warrior kind of effect. Yeah. But somehow in person, they still feel safe to do yeah. that. Like, you wouldn't say that to me if we were just no. having a conversation at a cocktail party. You has, just have this, like, weird. Has this ever happened where, like, someone's heckling someone and a comedian just, like, snap and jump off the stage and start fighting the person? Just like I've seen, like, clips and stuff. I've never seen it in person. Yeah. Um, uh, we have this <laughs> show in Denver called The Gong Show, um, which is exactly what it sounds like people can get gonged off stage and so it's a late night tuesday thing on like colfax which is like not known for you know it, it'd be like a bar on aurora or something you know <laughs> like it's um it's just kind of a, a rowdy kind of situation so you get two minutes guaranteed and then after two minutes anybody in the room can gong you off stage and heckling and stuff is actually encouraged. It's like meant to be like a can you win over the crowd and get the room on your side kind of vibe. And so at that show, I've seen things get a little physical. Somebody, um, I've never seen a comedian like jump off stage and go after somebody, but I have seen people rush the stage. Okay. okay. So obviously you have your own style, right? Was any comedians like you, you kind of like, you know, like look up to and trying to base your style off of? Um, Not in terms of like style i don't think i I definitely want to try to not emulate other people's style but some of the people that i look up to are definitely more like the political comedians and um i got to see amanda seals live a few years ago and i like the way that she just like she speaks her truth and then finds a way to make it funny with stuff that's not funny (laughs) you know what i mean uh michelle wolf um awesome minaj i was a big fan of what he did with uh, his special before you know all the things came out about him lying about anthrax and shit but um he had a i call it powerpoint comedy so he had visual effects so you know if my background in, in public speaking coaching and pitches and stuff i'm like oh i can't wait to do powerpoint comedy and just do different like versions of comedy like there's still so much that i haven't gotten to explore so i have my voice like i, I can't remember who it was my boyfriend sent me this clip of somebody talking about how like you're always going to have your voice but then over time you refine it but it's always you so i have my voice but i think the style is gonna evolve the same way like your personality is kind of your personality but you evolve and you mature and you grow a little bit but you're still kind of always you that's what i think it is and so i'm still finding that in a sense but so why do you think some people find like one person funny another person not funny what do you think that is Uh, my friend nina davis says told me that the the best joke uh I mean, she didn't come up with this, but she's the one who put this in my head. Is like the best joke is an inside joke with a friend, right? Where you can just like look at somebody across the room and, and you just you, busting out and laughing, and right? Say, no. And so, like, if we can create kind of that feeling, it's not going to be the same, but pseudo feeling of me, you. There's a hundred people sitting around you in the crowd, but me and you are having this like moment. 
and like we got this yeah. like inside joke now if you can recreate like that feeling um that's the bit like that's the best one right like that's the biggest feeling and so you're not gonna be friends with everybody you're not gonna connect with everybody people aren't going to get that spark from every single person and that's part of like the beauty of art and humanity how we all have room to grow and so I've known for a while, and you're very, you're very detailed. You're very, uh, you do a, like you're really good at doing planning, right? So, for your comedy career, do you have a plan out like you want to be certain, like certain places, like you want to be like performing in front of ten thousand people across in five years. You want to like do like go to Joe Rogan's Station of Comedy show and perform in two years. Like you have like a, I'm pretty sure you have a plan of what you want to do, right? Uh, sort of, kind of. Not really, That's to be honest. Um. Yeah, part of my, like, transformation during, like, COVID and stuff was just um, kind of letting go of some of that rigid. I still set goals, but, you know, I don't call them goals. I call them intentions and, like, just the, the rigidity of it. And it's um, more, like, I have big long-term goals, sure, but in terms of, like, five years, two years, like, I don't have it broken down quite like that versus... I'm thinking about like my lifestyle overall and wanting to be a touring comedian and there's milestones along the way that I've identified. And so then on like a short term basis, I'm like, okay, I got these long term things. So what do I need to be doing this month, this week to work towards that? And so it's like at the micro right now, but yeah, I actually don't have like this, this roadmap. There are some plugs that I absolutely want to do. Um, there's some different shows like don't tell that I'd like to do. And um, other than that, it's not broken down the way like I would approach a business plan or the way I have approached business plans in the past. Okay. So let's suppose someone came to you and say, hey, Christina, man, we really love your comedy. You're, you're killing it. We're going to put a show on. And you can pick any four co comedians to go, go on tour with you. Be you and four other comedians. <laughs> Me what four, four comedians? other comedians. It could, it could be any comedian. Famous people you know. Like, what four would you pick to be like this, this nationwide tour? That's funny. Um, that that's a great question that I would have never even considered. So if I'm I'm getting asked to bring four comedians with me, I'm gonna pick four people that are funnier than me. Um. So do I have like buying power just to get any comedians any, together? That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. I don't know. I probably would get some of my faves. I would probably do something. Um. We're, I don't know. We kind of money. You got to give me more details now because I'm like, wait, do I have like how much budget do I have? Because then I'm just paying the homies, right? Like yeah. four people. Could we have four people, different people in every city? Like, <laughs> uh, four you people. know me. I'm trying four. to bring yeah. as many yeah. people as possible. Yeah. Four people. Um, People whose comedy. I don't know. I probably, I can't even, I feel like this is going to come back to haunt me. So I don't, I don't even want to say four names, but okay. I probably would, uh, want to put together like a cohesive show where you know i've been on the road recently with josh Dway featuring for him um i work really well with my friend nina davis and um those would probably be two people that i'd reach out to first and then from there trying to put together when i think about when i produce a show and i think about who's coming on to the show i want there to kind of be an arc and have a enough diversity that people aren't feeling like they just saw the same comedian yeah. five times. Yeah. Um, but also enough of like a, a flow of energy and yeah. stuff like that. You don't want too many monotone yeah, kind of deadpan exactly, yeah. people in a yeah. row, but you don't want somebody to go from that to like this high energy, like rolling around on the floor type of comedian. It, it just is too jarring. I think for people like that's like the interesting thing about open mics is you get all this style. It's not booked. It's not, you know, um, uh, thought about in that way because it's not supposed to be but yeah i'm gonna think about it i'll i'll okay. send you my top four and you can put it on the screen in okay. the post all right um and you're also working as a event sales manager at the denver improv i do i sell that room when we're not doing comedy shows okay. um one time we actually did a private comedy show for a group of like 30 people and for anybody who's been to the denver improv it's a big um not theater style in the sense that there's like balcony and levels to the seating but there's tiers to the to the seating and there's there's tables but it seats like 350 so for 30 people <laughs> um and we had two we had three comedians because um rob ward was in town so he came through and hosted for us 
uh, and people loved it. And those people paid to like rent out the room and have a few comedians come through and they were drinking. The show was at like 1 p.m. It was so funny to me that um, people would want that. Like I wouldn't think most companies would do that, but there's a demand for it. So what's your process of coming up with a joke, right? You just like have a notebook, you write, you write ideas down, and then you like test it out with, with different audiences and like refine it and stuff like that. Most of my jokes come from storytelling. And so I usually start by just telling the story. And that usually takes a long time and I'm not getting laughs because I'm I'm trying to figure it out and you're like recalling versus telling the story. So I go through that uncomfortable thing in front of people. Usually I call it just like writing on stage. Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, from there, it's just, it's almost like the brain dump, like I would do with like a consulting project, right? Like we're just going to get it all out and then whittle away and then refine and find the perfect words and the perfect, perfect place to put it on the website or whatever. It's kind of like that. So then I'm like, okay, doing this. And then in my case, it's comedy, so where can I exaggerate something? Where can I kind of like set people up and they think it's going to go this way and then I take them off there? Um, and so it's just a process of refining and refining. So like last night or two days ago, I was at Seward Park and I saw these ladies like not washing their hands, right? So last night I went to two different mics and I kind of tried some different versions of like, would you do it like, would you do this? <laughs> it's kind of like that, right? And you just find the metaphors and the comparisons and just write and then you try it and then the stuff that gets laughs you keep and if you try it 10 15 times and it's just not getting laughs like maybe it's just not funny so it just takes like 10 50 times to, to like go from original idea to like, okay this is like this is the perfect joke so to speak yeah and i mean i still refine jokes i just wrote a new tag i was preparing for that competition i mentioned and so i'm like going through my set going through my set joke that i wrote two years ago I found a new tag to it. So now it's like, okay, and I got to bring that joke and, and try that out, right? So to me, a joke's never going to be done. Um, there's like the technical side of it, like a business perspective once you've published something like it's out there. But other than that, like, I don't, I don't see a joke ever being done. That's, that's a good point. Like, suppose you tell a joke somewhere next week, right? And then you, then someone like basically cops the same joke and someone sends you, hey, this guy stole your joke. What happens? Is, like, is there any legal ramifications you can do? It's like, it's, it's like, like when Instagram copies Snapchat, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Uh, there's some kind of code of conduct between comedians where they say, okay, <laughs> I know this is Christina's joke. That's funny. Um, code of conduct among comedians. <laughs> that's a joke in itself. Um, <laughs> that, that's the sketch right there. Code of <laughs> no, joke stealing is like a thing for real. And I don't think unless you have something like copywritten published um that there's any legal route that you can take particularly because with copyright stuff there's parody is a thing and so i'm sure there's some gray area there where it's yeah. like how can you prove that they weren't just making fun of you telling the joke you know what i mean oh, like yeah. Yeah. i'm sure there's like a lot of like loopholes in that for comedy um but yeah you can look up like carlos mencia has been Accused of stealing yeah, jokes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cat Williams said some other he when he did that interview. Scanner sharp, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he, it happens. Yeah. Um, I had an interesting thing happen one time because I have this little joke that I told and then um a local comedian, she does these like posts on Inst or Facebook every day, like good morning to everybody except the people who da 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 da. It, it was like so it was her framework but it felt like she was like using my premise kind of and a couple of people were like isn't this your joke and i'm like no nah, my joke's like this but kind of it's my joke and it's like is it though or are we all just humans and premises get recycled everybody's talking about kamala harris right now i even made a fucking joke about it last night so like are we stealing each other's jokes or are we all just talking about the same thing yeah i think on one hand some people say like you're stealing jokes but on the other hand is like you're complimenting that person by you know, we we using a joke, right? To an extent, yeah. Sometimes it's annoying, but I'm just like, well, if somebody can steal your joke, then you didn't put enough of you into it, in in a sense. And so all of my stuff comes from stories. So it's like, I nine times out of ten, I probably got the receipt. A lot of stuff I just noticed like a year ago, um, is where I got the inspiration for one of my jokes that I've been telling now. I guess for like a year. 
Um, but it was literally like I'm like working on my car and I like did an Instagram story like I can finally relate to men. <laughs> and then like that eventually turned into a joke that I tell like I'll tell it tonight during the set. And um, I don't know if somebody like took that joke or that setup or that punchline like they're just still not going to be able to tell it like me. So it's just something I'm not too worried about. And being so new to this as well, I'm like, that just means go right. So it'll and be better. So change, change the subject. You're still playing basketball, right? Ah, no, not really. I no. try to didn't sometimes. You, I, didn't you just play your basketball thing? I thought I thought Those Instagram. pictures were from June 2023. Okay. Um, I shoot around sometimes here yeah. and there. But yeah, there's a basketball, a charity basketball mm -hmm. tournament every summer. Um, in Denver for St. Jude's research, okay. at whatever it's called. That we love them. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't get to play this year because it was just the other day. So okay. I was just helping promote it and, and share the pictures from last year where my team did take the championship title. Um, I scored about six points in that game, <laughs> missed my free throws. Um, but yeah, that was it. Was a lot of fun. There's it's surprising like how many um athletes like people who like played d1 basketball and stuff like that um are comedians now not just like people who are rich and then decide to do comedy and so um with everything you're doing how do you take care of yourself oof um i have like my morning practices and like a morning routine that i'm pretty dedicated to that that helps me stay grounded and whatnot um Try to get as much rest as possible. So now that I've reached a certain curve with comedy, I feel like I don't have to grind as hard every night at the open mics. Like for a while there, I set this weird goal my first year in comedy that I wanted to be on stage 300 times in my first year. And so I was going like really, really hard going to four mics a night. And like, I'll do that every once in a while. Um, but yeah, just get my sleep is really important to me. Um, and just staying around people who are like positive and stuff like that. I'm in a new relationship that's been like really helpful for me helping to take care of myself. And um, yeah, so that's probably about it. I could probably do a better job. I need to stretch more. That's for sure. So when you're doing your comedy, do you find like different demographics like laugh at different things? Like mm -hmm. different cultures have different, you know, funny bones, so to speak. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely like anything you think like marketing and stuff like that, right? It's like you could look at something and um be like these people are going to more likely be these type of buyers or they're gonna more likely laugh at these types of jokes um so I do try to consider again i'm I don't know if it's just because of my background or if I'm still getting over people pleasing stuff and I just or my ego just really wants. To make people laugh but i'm gonna cater things a little bit to the crowd i want to make people laugh so it's like if i'm in i did a show in marysville and there's like more blue collar people working at the boeing plant and everett you know at the show i'm not gonna like shove <laughs> my political beliefs down their yeah. throats you know i might edit a word here or there um i might switch up the the gender sometimes in in certain jokes and because that that's something i've noticed i have a couple jokes they are written for women and often at open mics particularly i'm performing in front of mostly men and so i don't get that many laughs that night but i know that shit's funny and women are actually the ones that are really uh driving ticket sales for comedy so seattle's pretty liberal is what does denver conservative denver's liberal what's up what is denver denver is is like you know on paper more liberal um but colorado in general is like a purple state it's, okay you know it's similar to washington in that effect um we have bigger roads and a lot more people with trucks <laughs> uh, a lot more guns we got more guns in colorado uh but yeah i think you you find a little bit more people who are a little bit more um maybe diverse in their beliefs so like they might be like hey gay, gay marriage but also want their gun rights yeah. you know um so we just we have an interesting mix and you see it from room to room even just you know this bar attracts this type of person 
this bar attracts that type of person. Um, we also are often doing comedy where people aren't expecting comedy to be, you know? And so uh, my comedian buddy Dave Stone said, he calls it ambush comedy. <laughs> And so that's a whole thing too, like mood and tone, right? Like environment. Um, we all love doing new talent night at Comedy Works because it's the like underground, low ceiling, super dark. Everybody's packed in. Laughs are reverberating really loud for you. It's an easy room and it doesn't matter really. There's usually a good mix of people in that room, like demographically. Whereas sometimes you're in a bar that's lit like this. And we're this far apart and like that's where you have people yelling at you and they think they can talk to you and stuff but um yeah i think like the environment and stuff you have to like give people a break a little bit like they're they came here to have a drink and catch up with their buddy you know like you can't be mad at them for talking during the comedy show <laughs> like they didn't know there's gonna be a fucking comedy show here um which is why we should charge for comedy shows so people pay to come into anyway so, so Timing, is timing something you have to work on or timing just comes naturally to you? I think some of us, like, it comes more easily. This, um, it's more intuitive, maybe, and timing is super important. What I find interesting is when I am riffing, and so, like, and then, ooh, I say something funny, and so then I'm trying to recreate that timing, or you're, like, telling the joke for the 150th time, and it's, like, committing to it still um not rushing through it and stuff like that also the timing around um uh, laughs so the bigger the room the longer the laughs last the more it takes for the sound to travel etc um you have to consider that into your timing as well um but yeah i think i think i have pretty good timing in general so right now I have your your uh, link link. I see. I was uh, like, "What is ha happening over there?" Yeah, your link tree. Can you go yeah. real fast? Like talk to you talk about these things you're doing. Your Patreon. You sure. just started Patreon, right? I did. I started Patreon. Um, because some people were like, "Do you have a Patreon?" <laughs> that's honestly why I started it. Um, that's why you see the call to action there. Sponsor me, so I consider these people my sponsors. Uh, if I get enough people, I'm going to get a jacket made with everybody's name on it. It's like a race car driver. It's going to be so much fun. And the Patreon has different levels. I see you have one level where, like, I I'm making this up probably, but one level, like, you like, you really got to go in detail with how you write your jokes. Or there's something on there that's, like, really, like, next level, right? Yeah, so there's some, like, low $1, pay what you can, 6 $11, right? Like, you want to throw a little money my way, you get some exclusive content. And then the next tier up is the writer's room. So that's a live Zoom or Google Meet session where, uh, why am I promoting any of these companies? It's a live video conference <laughs> um, where, yeah, I basically take every, take everybody through my writing process. And now that we've been doing it a couple of months too, I'm able to give kind of updates. So it's like, okay, here, I told you the story about what happened. So everybody got to hear about how this rich white lady tried to rob me in bail, right? And so then... Now I'll be able to give them an update this month on basically how that all and how that joke's been going and how I've pared it down to an actual I joke. Think I think it's so funny right here. Okay, yeah. So in this case, yeah. So I gave them an update right on I was during the writer's room. Um, somebody was like Sarah Sachuk, who's a comedian, was in there and she was uh, like yeah, I've been working on some like wedding season type of material because it's wedding season, and then I had just happened to um go to a wedding that's funny june 3rd maybe maybe there's there's another update actually maybe i hadn't gone to the wedding yet anyways i was riffing about how i hate weddings and how i hated being a bridesmaid it was like one of the worst things i've ever experienced so then i was able to uh do a call back to one of my other jokes and so that's what that note is referencing um right there but yeah also, nobody was actually named Michael, so that's a that's an example where stories uh, get changed. And wow, look at that outdated list of shows there. That is a Google Doc for those of you who don't have a website yet, like me, um, or you're paying for it and still haven't published it, <laughs> like me. Um, Google Docs, you can put a lot of information in there. Uh, I've also got like my EPK, just like a short link, and it's just saved in a Google Drive, and it just goes to that, and I update it sometimes. What's this a uh, petition thing? We go versus 3M. Yeah. Um. Another thing I'm doing is I'm actually going to be 
helping, I am in the midst of helping um, the Wingo family with their uh, documentary about the, this, this petition is specifically about the, the racial discrimination case. And this is like, in Colorado. This all happened. The family's in Colorado, but this all happened in um, South Dakota. And the case is crazy in and of itself with the harassment and the retaliation and like several people were involved. Um, but then during the, the case itself, there was a bunch of corruption that, and it's still happening like to this day. So the documentary is going to be about that corruption. Uh, and I can't talk too much about it right now, but yeah, the petitions in my link, uh, or the petition is linked in my bio. Um, and that's still helpful because it shows that people are paying attention. Um, like there's potential that like, the state of South Dakota and the state of Minnesota are going to end up being sued. There's a lot going on there, but, uh, you know, I've always um, had a social justice yeah. focus yeah. and um, haven't been protesting and getting so, arrested do you, do you, <laughs> anymore. Do your but jokes have like a social justice like bit to them? A lot of them do. I have this um, trope that I kind of, I kind of let myself into it to make it like funnier and just, I think when you make fun of yourself, it diffuses the situation a little bit, you know? So this wannabe woke white woman character that I have. Um, so I use that to talk. That's, that's how I uh, tie in a lot of social justice stuff. Um, but then also the idea of wannabe woke and like, how we're all kind of hypocrites at some point and like it's kind of impossible to fully live up to your morals and values in in a corrupt society but um definitely have some political jokes and then when i can tell people they're not so into that i just switch it up real quick with like a sex joke okay just, literally sometimes i've said that i'm like okay you want me to talk about sex again <laughs> got it got it you don't you don't want to hear a woman talk about politics <laughs> and hear about my vagina cool let's do it um because like i said i want laughs so yeah. it's like okay if you're not feeling this uh but also it's inspired conversations like i had this one dude come up to me and he's like i actually wrote a joke about our interaction um but he he basically was like i don't agree with anything you say fundamentally but you make me laugh yeah and to me that's like the highest compliment that you can see past your feelings about it and be like damn that's a good joke yeah. that's funny you know um so yeah that's when i talk about like socialism going back to like location too like my socialist stuff does not hit too well in miami yeah. where there's a lot of cubans who left cuba because they don't like yeah. socialism yeah. yeah it might not be a good set for you so i always have to acknowledge that right i still do the joke right i just acknowledge it yeah. i'm like i'm like act, you know I'll pretend like i'm gonna duck from tomatoes or something <laughs> you know um same thing i, I have a joke um where I'm like, we've all heard the phrase A cab, all cops are bastards. Yeah. How y'all doing out there? <laughs> you know, like I, I definitely let them get a taste. It's so like with that joke in particular, I have like three versions of that joke. And my so. thing is like whatever your demographic is, like if you're a policeman, fireman, uh Democrat, you have to be able to if you can't laugh at yourself, someone makes a joke about you. Like I'm I'm from Texas. You can make Texas jokes all you want, right? I don't care, right? If it's funny, I'm gonna laugh, you know. Yeah, and that's the big thing, if it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> if it's funny. Some people use comedy. Uh, as an excuse to just say, Texas sucks. Outrageous you, thing. You, you from Texas, you suck. Yeah, it's like okay, that's not but funny. why? Yeah, yeah, that's not funny. Yeah. So exactly, do people do this as a comedian? This is probably way too detailed. Like, suppose you tell a joke, right? And you suppose you tell a joke, or we'll say at a comedy club tonight, and you like track the laughs you get. Like, okay, this night I got three laughs. This next night I get two laughs. You kind of track like metrics and stuff of that. That's like too much. Um. It's funny because shout out to Roger Hack, who used to run or help run the uh, new talent night program at Comedy Works. He would do that for us. He would time um, when our first laugh was and then tell us how many laughs we got the whole set and then your average laughs per minute or whatever. Um, I don't actually sit down and do that for myself. But when that information was given to me. I was like, okay, cool. So it gave me something to kind of go against. So some people I'm sure do that for every show. I know there's people who keep um, spreadsheets of every time they're on stage and keep notes about what worked and what didn't work. I see a lot of my friends come off stage and 
write something down, you know, because something came to them or they want to capture the reaction. We're all always at least audio. Well, not all of us, but most of us who are serious about this are um, audio recording at the minimum, if not video recording, even open mic sets, because you might say something that you might riff on something and say, you know, you want you didn't you didn't have your notebook out on stage, so you have a, a track record of it. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of different ways to kind of track the progress um, and the laughs and all of that. I'm not quite that detailed, but I do try to get a laugh within the first. And do you have like a group of comedians you hang out with, where like I suppose you go on stage after your set's done, they come to you and they say, hey, Christina, you should have done this, try this next time, like this hit, but maybe you did this." Um, it's not so formal, like. There are like some like little clicks and stuff like that. And there's writing groups and workshops and stuff in general at a mic the kind of, I guess like the etiquette around it is if you have an idea and you want to share it with somebody, I think you know, some people are kind of, a lot of comedians are real socially awkward and don't really know how to do the interpersonal communication thing. So some people aren't great at like delivering this, but a common way, a nice way to do it is like, Hey, I thought of a tag for your joke about pencils. Do you want to hear it? And then if they give you permission, then it's like, hey, I had this idea or whatever. Um, then there's other people you build rapport with. Like I have people who are like my actual friends. We hang out outside of comedy. We've built some relationship. We've actually had conversations. We've done shows together. Those people, if they came up to me and they were one and they wanted to give me some advice, I would listen to it. Um PJ Johnson did this a couple weeks ago. He's like, not that you asked, but my only advice would be da 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 da. So he acknowledged that, like, hey, you didn't ask, but um, so it's yeah, it's not like a okay, watch my set and give me notes kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah. But if you've got an idea for somebody, or every once in a while, I notice this with new people, they will ask for notes on their set. Um, and I hate when they do that because ninety percent of the time we're not paying attention to each other's sets. So I'd be like. I don't know, man. People laugh. Good job. Keep doing it. Don't stop. So what about this situation? Like, I'm making this up. Like, suppose, like, there's a new comedian, right? And you watch a comedian, like, four or five times. And you and all the other comedians are like, man, this person is horrible, right? Yeah, yeah. Why are you doing that rape joke? Yeah. yeah. Like, this person is Yeah, we talk about it. horrible, yeah. Like, one of us needs to tell him that this comedy thing is not for him or her. No, though. Um, you don't. They have. You have to figure that out on your own. Okay. Like... It's, I think some people might do that. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody, but it, it, it would be, in my opinion, wrong to okay. just be like, this isn't for you. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, it's art. So how are you going to tell somebody That's art true. isn't for them? Yeah. Um, especially we're talking open mic comedians, which you mean it's not for them. Like anybody's allowed to put their name on the list. Like that's part of it. So if any of my colleagues are doing that, I don't agree with that. But um, it's more of if they ask, right, then you give them your opinion. Okay. Um, so the reason I just brought that up, there was a woman, it, she was trying that joke for so long. And it's just like, nobody can tell you not to to talk about it because if that's what you feel inspired to speak about into a microphone, but bro, it's not funny. <laughs> you got to find the funny in it if you're going to keep talking about it or pivot and write new material. And that's what this particular comedian that I'm thinking of did. And and um, I think she just did her first new talent night and stuff like that. So she's she stuck around and like she's getting funnier. And like if we were just like, no, dude, you're not funny. You shouldn't do comedy. She pro and especially for women, she probably would have quit and not kept trying and not um, continued. And so, yeah, I, d I don't think we should be like. So off the top of head, what percentage of comedians are like men versus women? Is that like any, any other news like no text like 90 percent men, 10 percent women? Is um, it evenly balanced in comedy? It's not, I don't know if it's as bad as tech. But there's nights where there's 25 names on the list and I'm the only woman. Yeah. I mean, so I recently watched the Netflix comedy, uh, Tom Brady special. I think, um, what's her name? Um, not Nikki Glaser. Maybe it was Nikki Glaser. She was the only female on the whole roast, roast thing. Yeah. I think that's her name. Mm -hmm. She, she, whoever was, she freaking killed it. I yeah. I didn't watch it, but I heard she was the best. Oh and that God. doesn't surprise it was, me. It was bad. It yeah. Was like, yeah. She killed it. Like, she's yeah. another female comedian that I really like. It was uh, kind of messed up, right? So Randy Moss went after her, right? Like, uh, yeah, like, dude, yeah. I would, I, I would say, hey, I, I'm not going up after her, like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you said he went after her for a second. I was all like, why would he do that to himself? Yeah, that's like. All right, it was Nikki Glacier killed, and then Randy Moss was the next next roaster, right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, why would they put a non comedian up after the comedian? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think they did the comedian, not like football player. Comedian. Some, some football, like Julian Edelman, he killed it. Bill Belichick, surprise, he freaking killed it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roasts are fun. Um, I think when it's like a roast of a person, it's it's more fun, in my opinion, because like we're all kind of there for like one purpose. I don't know, every it's not my thing. Yeah. It's like I said, I can be mean, but I don't. Uh, and not that roasts are supposed to be mean, but yeah. it can get pretty cutthroat. There's a whole, it's actually like a nation, it's international now, actually. I think it's just called Roast Battle. Mm-hmm. And so Denver has like a chapter, yeah. and um, I think Jeff Stonick just went and, or he's there now in Austin yeah. representing Denver and like these big tournaments where it's one on one battles. Uh, I'm actually roasting somebody next month in Denver. I'm representing my hometown, Colorado Springs, um, although I live in Denver now. Uh, yeah, so we're doing a whole like, city versus city so it's colorado springs versus fort collins um that can get pretty intense there's a you look like roast battle that i did and every joke literally starts with you look like um just back and forth for three minutes is real intense i forgot where i was going with all this but yeah no worries there's a lot of so is the patreon Patreon going like you wanted to do or is what's your plan with the patreon but like, what's the ultimate goal? Like, obviously, another revenue source, of course. But yeah, um, definitely another revenue source. Uh, essentially, I wanted to give people an opportunity who are like, I want to support. Like, I got stickers for merch, and it's just like, how much shit can you actually sell? You know. Um, so it's another way to give people access to me as well. A lot of people that I've made connections with, and now that I travel doing comedy are not going to be able to come see me perform very often. Um, and it is live performance is like the thing, but also, and there's so much more to comedy and to the art form that I want to explore. And so that's going to be the space where um, web series, different sketch type stuff, me exploring and, and trying to do stuff and the people who are like really drawn to me and want to support that. That's why I call it sponsorship, right? Like if you want to support that, I want to be able to give perks back. Um, so I am also trying to talk to some different brands about actually getting um, merch that just goes straight to my Patreon members. So, um, so kind of like a... So how you market this? Like how are you doing that? Mostly just through uh, Instagram right now. I don't do a good job of marketing it at all, to be honest. Consistency is key, right? Um, And like I said, the way it's focused right now is more for people who know me already and are like, yeah, I want to support you. How can I support you? I want to join. I want to be able to come to this writer's room session. Um, I also added a tier for joke writing. So for people who aren't comedians and they're like, I've got this idea and I, I, I think this would be funny. It's like, okay, cool. Let's, let's see if we can turn it into a joke and then, you know, maybe encourage some other people to go try comedy. Um, and that was something that my boyfriend actually encouraged me to do. And I'm like, I'm, I'm still new to this. Why am I trying to teach people how to write jokes? And he's like, well, as we all know, the term expert is just relative, right? Yeah. You've got to be a little bit ahead of somebody else to, to help them out. So, um, yeah, kind of a, a side goal that came out of it is maybe getting some more people to try comedy and especially women and just underrepresented people because it is very straight white male dominated uh, at the moment. And are you still doing like startup pitch coaching and communication consulting? I took a sabbatical from that and I'm actually in a process of trying to figure out how to either jump back into that specifically. I did a, a consulting session last week that was a lot of fun. And I'm also trying to figure out how to fuse the facilitation work that I did with communication and teaching skills with comedy and team building type, that that kind of side of things. There's a lot of corporate improv and and things like that, workshops and such. So I'm trying to think of like where my unique art side, creative side and my business side can come together and increase some offerings. It seems like you'd have a lot of material from your pitching, coaching startup days that you can transfer to your, your comedy, I would think. Yeah, a lot of it does, especially when we're talking about like stage fright, because that's the thing that holds most people back is just yeah. the getting up there in the first place. And I even get nervous sometimes still. It always catches me by surprise too. Like all of a sudden, like the anxiety like hits me and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm gonna do my breathing exercises yeah. and stuff and I'm fine. But um, yeah, I think there there's some room for that. 
I just, when it comes to like stand up specifically, like I really want to focus my energy on writing and getting funnier and getting more stage time, not trying to build some like coaching writing yeah. business or yeah. something. Um, there's other comedians doing that stuff. Um, and I just, yeah, I want to, I want to figure out how to blend those two things together, but I don't want to force it. Yeah. And obviously there's only 24 hours a day too, you know, so. There's only 24 hours a day. Yeah. Um, I would like to get back to stuff though that I can do remotely. Cause right now, uh, one of my, uh, gigs is, uh, I'm a driving instructor. And so that like re- driving a car. Yeah. What? Yeah. Behind the wheel driving instructor is that, one of my gigs. I see you're teaching like teenagers or like. Mostly teenagers, but also uh, adults who either um, their license expired, they got it revoked or whatever. Um, I had a lady who totaled like two company vehicles. And so they made her come take our our little course. Yeah, you got money coming from everywhere. Something like that. Yeah, it's still not enough. It's still not adding up. That's why I was like, I want to try to reduce my revenue streams, actually, and just increase them. Yeah. Um, And I've also part of like shifting my mindset around like goals and all that is like, I don't necessarily need money to meet all of my needs. Like if you want to let me go grocery shopping and use your food stamps, like there's lots of ways yeah. I could get what I need um, through either sponsorship or just like community, like sponsorship. Quote, so unquote. I met this guy a month ago. So every, every month I MC this open mic pitch competition, right? I said, this guy uh-huh. and he does a, I think it's called task driver, right? He's telling me one time, these, these, this, this couple, you know, I think they would, you know how you get the blue apron delivered? They would pay him to cook the blue apron. To cook their blue apron? Yeah. Like, you see, they, yeah. They ordered it and then paid him to come in and cook it. Yeah. Like, man, that's beyond lazy right there. But like, he said they paid me good money, so I just opened that's the blue wild. apron box and cook it, yeah. Like, fresh? Like, he was, like, serving them the plates, or would they still have to microwave it? He would do whatever he had to do. I'm get... just like curious because there's other ones out there where the food's already cooked. So like, why wouldn't you just order? Like, I mean, yeah, it's already cooked. It's already back done. there. You, yeah. Well, no, blue apron. You have to still cook it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So the ingredients come like pre-portioned. So this guy you're talking yeah. about, he's coming in and like being the chef. Yeah. Following his little recipe card. Yeah. Uh, that's funny as fuck. But there's other ones where it's just like you microwave it. You yeah. know, it's already cooked. So like, why wouldn't they just do that? I don't know. Yeah. But he said, like, "This is like some he's... people just have too much money." Yeah. And I see another another person pays them to do um oh this is even more insane so this one person pays them to load a dishwasher and wash the dishes in the dishwasher that's it that's the task that's it so you just pay like a hundred dollars or something something the same amount of money yeah okay so i guess i'm getting on task rabbit <laughs> when i get home what the fuck it's crazy right that is crazy i yeah i've I'm on Upwork and I've done some interesting things. Like, what are you on there? Um, I don't even know what I have like down as my thing, like it comms, whatever, whatever. But one of the things I did recently was um, this guy, he wrote a book that's like, I didn't read the book, obviously, but um, <laughs> it's something about like to shift your mindset and this, that, and the third. So he was like asking me these questions and like the book, like walks you through these questions. And so he's going to use them for social media promo or something. I should follow up. I, I did that. See where my face is, but um, <laughs> yeah. So there's definitely been some random things, but not a hundred dollars to yeah. but see. That's still like, you have to show up and go do something. Oh God. That's, that's the part I'm trying to avoid. Like I want to go back to, um, I don't know. I think the first time I did your podcast, you know, I was like at home. I'm just going to be at home, my blanket, my fuzzy robe. Everybody knows my white fuzzy robe. Yeah. Like that's, that's my comfort zone. So I have to like show up. I actually like the job and like coaching the kids, but uh, it's mostly kids, but um, yeah, like being on time somewhere, you know me. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, I know me. I know people agree with this. Like it was up to me. You'd have to retake your drive license every five years. A lot of people out here driving should not be driving. I think every five years you should have to retake your license. I'm, you know, not not mad at that in a in a general sense. Um, some kind of refresh, but also just because the laws change. So like little things, um, turning through the bike lane and shit like that. Uh, so yeah, I think just even from that perspective, so people can stay up to date, even if you're you're a good driver. The thing is, is like. 
then we're talking like, okay, you have to go pay to do this thing yeah, that, every that, five that, years. The bureaucracy comes in. Yeah, yeah. So then it's like, oh, okay. That, that's, that's the negative part. Yeah. Um, that's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting in Colorado right now is um, the DMV actually doesn't do driving tests anymore. You have to go through a driving school, mm. which is kind of weird. Because, like, when I got my license the last time I got my <laughs> license, when I was. I think it was just yeah, I was still eighteen. I just lost my license because yeah. of a drinking ticket in college, <laughs> um, which is funny because the only reason we got caught is because we didn't want to drink and drive. We stayed on campus, and then that's how we got caught. Okay. And then I lost my license through the legal process, which was insane. But again, money generation is what we're getting yeah. at here. So it's like I don't want to say like, you know, freedom of movement, blah blah blah. You got to go every five years and you know report your address and all these things and do all that, but. Oof, some kind of, can you stay in between the lines even? Uh, maybe incentivizing it so it's not like you have to take a test or whatever, but like if you can pass this, give you money or something. Yeah. <laughs> right? So is there a place that you, you want to perform at? I mean, I, I mean, like, that's kind of like, like not like Madison Square Garden, nothing like that, but maybe like a place like Miami, San Diego, there's like a venue that's like um, I don't know about what's next for me, but like the comedy cellar and probably like Laugh Factory in Hollywood. Okay. It, those those are probably some of the big ones. Um, improv in Hollywood. Uh, I've gotten to do some pretty cool club comedy works. Downtown Denver is, I think they claim top five club in the country. Um, and from what I hear from other comedians, that you know they love it. Dave Chappelle loves performing there and people like that. So um, I've also gotten to perform at an open mic at the Laugh Factory in Chicago, which is like a really cool right. theater style room. Um, and yeah, those are like the two big ones. I've also performed at the Denver Improv and stuff. So I've, I've gotten lucky to, to get on some cool stages. So at this point, though, any of them, anybody who will have me and will pay me, I'll be <laughs> there. Um, and so like when you went to Chicago, I guess you had to pay for your, your way there. Yeah, um, that's actually an interesting story. So the first time I did a couple shows in Chicago, I was actually at Madison Comedy Week last year, and I met some Chicago comedians, and it's just a few-hour drive. Got offered some spots. There's a club there called the Lincoln Lodge, and it actually has three different rooms. Um, so there's three different comedy shows going on at any given time. And so I got on one show, and then I was talking to another comedian. He's like, oh, I'm running a show that night across the hall so, like, Ooh. so i had to do some guest spots there um and then a couple weeks later i'm in colorado and i'm just chatting with some other comedians and they're like yeah we're, we're about to just go visit my sister who lives like an hour from chicago and try to do some comedy there and stuff and i just made all these connections there and at the time i was technically homeless i was like couch surfing and stuff so i'm all like yeah fuck it i'll go on the road um so yeah that that was definitely like a last minute pay your way kind of thing um i got booked out of state for the first time in albuquerque and that was similarly a pay your pay my way kind of thing um maybe in a couple of years we'll start getting that travel stipend uh included and then once you reach a certain level and you're getting booked at like the headline clubs usually there's either uh they just they'll book the stuff for you kind of thing we booked your hotel we booked your flight or you can do a travel buyout where you just get a set number of dollars to cover your travel expenses. And if you can budget, you keep the extra money. So when you're doing a set, like suppose someone goes on, goes on before you, right? Do you prefer that that person like kind of doesn't do well? Or is it better if you follow someone who like fucking killed it, right? Or does that even matter? Um, I prefer people to kill it. Okay. I want the energy high. I want to okay. come in with people happy and glad to be there and, ex and then excited just, for they, more. You just continue the momentum. Yeah. I think some people are intimidated by that. They're like, oh, I have to go after this person. Like, oh, you know, and it's, I'm just like, I get where they're coming from because it's like there is a, the law of relativity is a thing. So sure, if you're not as funny as that last person, it's going to be noticeable. Yeah. But, um, so much harder to dig out of a hole i okay. think personally um or starting cold kind of sucks you know um when i did the the competition a couple weeks ago uh 
I was the first person after the host and everybody's yeah. like, oh, it's such a tough spot. And I'm like, only because it's a competition. Like, yeah. I need to be remembered or whatever. But the the host spot sometimes can be a little, you got to get people focused and warmed up. And again, it depends on the venue too. When you're in a comedy club where everybody's sitting this close yeah. together and we're all focused and it's dark and it's like that versus when we're in a bar and, or a brewery and it's all echoey and you've got to, you know, get people yeah. focused. Um, but yeah, I prefer, I prefer to follow the funny. I'm not, I don't understand that, like, like I'm secretly hating on <laughs> I'm secretly hating on you, so I'll look better. Again, maybe it's my ego, but I don't need you to do bad for yeah. me to do good. Yeah. So I might be making this up, but I remember one time on the Joe Rogan Show podcast, he was talking about the comedians, right? Because Joe Rogan has a lot of comedians on there. It wasn't anybody really famous they wanted new, but he's telling the story, like, he was, a, he was a, doing a set at some comedy store, right? Like, five comedians. He was supposed to go on, like, fourth, right? And they said, hey, um, Dave Chappelle's here. Dave Chappelle wants to go on. So we're going to put up Dave Chappelle on before you. You went after Dave Chappelle. I was like, oh, I was like, oh shit. Yeah, that might suck a little bit. <laughs> um, man. I was... can you, put, you can't put Dave on last? Like, no, nah, Dave can only come for 10 minutes and he has to leave, right? We're going to put him. Before. Yeah. I would still love that, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'll take it. Because mm-hmm. think about, like, how focused everybody is after yeah. that. And, like, sure. Some people might get up and leave, like, okay, Dave's gone, so we're yeah. gonna leave, but not really at a comedy club. Like, I mean, the opportunity, I think the opportunity that guy had, right, to come after Dave Chappelle, like, what everyone's focused, everyone's focused on the stuff you know, they're, yeah, they're, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, and I'm not gonna lie, if that happened to me, I would probably be sitting there trying to write some callbacks and some yeah. little, little jokes to yeah. reference his set and yeah. try to keep people like, yeah. I try to use that energy, yeah, for sure. Um, but then also use that attention to get my shit off. But yeah, yeah I would definitely try to play off of it and not be intimidated and by it. It was me. I would definitely like when I'm walking on stage, walking off, like, "Hey, Dave, here's my number. You know, let's let's connect. You know, let's you know, let's, you, know <laughs> you know." Yeah, um, that's something that's interesting too. I haven't been at a situation like that where somebody super famous just popped up, um, but comedy, you know, for the most part, the the comedians will hang out and yeah. stuff in the in the green room or in the in the back area and stuff. And so, like, you kind of get a chance to meet these guys and stuff, and they're not as like far away as you think. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like, what's the etiquette of like sliding your business card yeah, and stuff yeah. like that? Like, yeah. Check out my tape. Like, yeah, it, it just right. feels like a fucking local rapper running around with CDs in the early two thousands. Oh man, think of that. Like recently, so you know we're, we're right by the water. All the tourist people are right. Uh huh. So about two weeks ago, I walked down there, go get some to eat, right? And this guy tried to hand me a CD. I'm like, dude, I'll buy this if you can tell me how I'm going to play it. If you can tell me how I'm going to play this, I'll, I'll, buy, I'll, I'll buy all your CDs from I know exactly who you're talking about, too. Those dudes have been out here for like 15 years selling them CDs, man. They dropped about 10 CDs in the last 15 years. Like, how am I, how am I going to play this? Like, But for real, how are you? I had a whole situation. I helped my friend who's in prison run his publishing company called black sheep publishing and uh they were doing a podcast and yeah they tried to send me the cd so they finally figured out how to get it on a cd mail me the cd i'm like all right i figured out i go to the library go to the public library shout out public libraries and they have a converter thing that you can get bt dubs for everybody who does not have a cd player there is a little it, it looks like an external hard drive and you plug it in and you can play the cd okay so i did all those steps to come to find out they did not upload the actual files. They copied over the shortcut, you know, that you put on your desktop. Yeah. They copied that file over. So it was like nothing basically on the CD. Um, yeah, yeah. That was a few months ago and I have not seen an update in the project, but go CDs and plastic. <laughs> They're also like the worst like audio quality. Like CDs yeah. was the worst thing we ever did, I think. For sure. I don't know if it was the worst thing we've ever done, but at the same time, making a mix CD and, you know, that was curating playlists. Like uh, my friend does this, uh, Mel the Oracle. She's got a, a like a radio station basically called Groove Soul FM, and she makes these like curated playlists on Spotify. And so it just yeah, some of them are nice and short, and it reminds me of that like you only had that CD, and some CDs you want to listen to in a specific order, and sometimes you might throw it on shuffle. So when you do like your your comedy stuff, like you're, you're doing like we'll say we're doing one Denver. 
Do they live stream it so people outside of Africa watch it, or you have to actually be in person to watch it? Like, how do people watch it later on, so to speak? Um, like, are they doing like TikTok videos for you and like pushing it out, or any kind of YouTube stuff, or is it like if you don't make your show, you just dismiss out? For the most part, it's a live performance yeah. art. So if you don't make the show, you don't make the show. Um, when you see jokes online, usually that means that person's already put that joke. For like people who are like more famous and stuff, and they've got specials, you don't want your your jokes getting out before you film your special. Yeah. So that's where um, Dave Chappelle was one of the first people I think to do this in comedy. Maybe not first person I heard about doing it in comedy where they take your phones. So now they have these like bags, lock bags, and so they don't actually take your stuff from you anymore. But um, they do that for us at New Talent Night at comedy works they they take they put people's phones in those bags and so like the etiquette is very much like you got to be there um you shouldn't be recording comedians even if they don't take your phone yeah. like and if you do like don't post that stuff get their permission yeah. first or whatever i've it's it's always weird honestly when you just see somebody randomly just like recording your set like for a second, you know, maybe they're getting a boomerang. A boomerang's a great way, by the way, if you want to take a picture or whatever, video, or if you do a little short video, cut the, cut the audio off and put a song over it or something. But don't post people's jokes. You don't know where they're at and that. They might not be ready for people to hear it outside of that room. Um, or they might be trying to save it up for, for that, like, published special moment. Um, that's why they call it a special, because it's special. I don't know why they call it that, actually, but. So when you write your jokes or you do a performance, like how much is it art? How much is it like a science? Like how much is it like Ooh. art? How much is it like, like technical? How much is it like more creative? That's interesting. Um, I'm trying to get, get like a ratio in my head. I don't know. I want to say it's kind of 50-50 maybe. There's, because art is often breaking the rules too. So it's like if if there's rules, they must be broken at, at to a certain point. But there are structures, like there's formulas, right? There's joke structures. You have a setup and a punchline. You have uh, the rule of threes, you know, which you've probably heard about just even with public speaking and stuff like that. Um, so there's some brain science stuff you could apply to it. So you could definitely get real formulaic with it and very technical and bring in this like more sciencey side to it. But at the end of the day, like you gotta be funny. You could have a setup and a punchline and not be funny. So um, I think the creative part, and again, that like we were talking about like stealing jokes earlier, it's like, you can't really steal a joke that's mine. You know, you could say it, but it's still mine. Um, because I've put enough of me into it. And I think that's like any art, like people can imitate. And sure, people can do replicas. And, and that's, that's a whole thing. Yeah, but. a good example that, um, remember the comedian Bernie Mac, the black comedian, he like died a few years ago. He had a set on Def Comedy Jam when he came out and he said like, I didn't scare these motherfuckers like five times. And, like everyone knew that was him, right? So if someone else did that, they would know, dude, that's Bernie Mac's thing, right? What, yeah, what are you doing right? exactly. So that's like, you could say those words again. Um, and there's like, you know, you take inspiration from stuff. And so I think the big thing there is like cite your sources, right? Because sometimes it just happens. Uh, you, you might say a little tag here or there. Like this is even the internet and the way memes work and stuff like that. Like your everyday person is like doing a Cat Williams line or, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of an example right now. And I can't, but you hear it sometimes and so it doesn't have to be this like all oh, you're taking but it's like yeah we all know where that came from so you might as well acknowledge it so back to public speaking real fast um any tips for people who are like having problem with public speaking like besides just to get up there and do it just get up there just fuck your nervous system just go <laughs> do it no um just some like quick tips things to that's what it is right you're having like a it's a chemical reaction. You're getting nervous. Your nervous system is now um, activated in a way, adrenaline up, cortisol up, these things not making the best decisions, et cetera. Um, so you can Google a billion different ways to like <laughs> calm your nerves. Uh, I like breathing techniques, um, breathing in for four seconds, holding it for four seconds, letting it out for four seconds, and just doing that until you feel your heartbeat calm down a little bit. Um, Maybe you need to do some deeper work around your, your self-esteem and your confidence. You need to be doing affirmations every day leading up to it. 
uh, we talk about third person self-talk too, like taking yourself out of it instead of saying I am going in like Brennan's about to crush it. Brennan's got the best set ever, you know, like going into that mode. Um, preparation. Competence breeds confidence. If you know what you're talking about, that's going to help. Um, so doing your homework and, and preparing and practicing as much as possible. You remember I practiced your pitch back in the day. That was like my big thing. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I know with me, right? I'm kind of different. I'm kind of weird. Like when I get the more nervous I am before I go to go and speak to people, the better I do. Mm -hmm. Like if, if every time I'm like, I got this, I'm not nervous. I always fucking vomit. Another thing too, like I, I obviously I rehearse and practice, but I can't do it in front of anyone else, right? I just I, I can't do it right. I, I shut down my body. I have so much anxiety. Even like I did it in front of you a couple of times because mm -hmm. I know you a little bit. So I was I was more nervous practicing in front of you versus the crowd, right? Yeah. So I, I for me I just like. I just blocks me up when I practice in front of people. That's so I can't do it. Yeah, I, I could get that. Uh, definitely, it's way easier for me to go up into an open mic than, like, from sitting down with my boyfriend. And yeah. he's like, run your joke by me. And I'm just like, uh, uh, no. Uh, uh. Yeah. Like, Here's the microphone. Where's the stage? Yeah. Um, so I get that. Like, the it's a weird, especially when you're practicing for a group to one person, it can be very... Yeah. Um, awkward so you know practicing can also be just putting up a camera and like yeah. doing that um walking around talking to your cat you know kind of picture the stage that you're going to be on and like how much space you're going to have so you can practice working that yeah. out so yeah practice doesn't have to be the full-on scrimmage um but also if you get the chance to scrimmage and go to the open mic yeah. pitch open mic before you go sit down with the investors that makes sense yeah. to me too so um yeah, practice like you play, I guess, too, is like creating that environment. So if it's going to stress you out, it's like, well, don't do that then because that's that's not helping, obviously. And yeah. there's other ways that you could still practice and achieve that goal. So are you doing anything in the startup community in Denver? I'm not. Okay. Just, yeah, straight up. I, when I went on sabbatical and stuff, I just kind of like, You're like essentially walked away from the business world in a sense, but had connections and stuff. So it was uh, as opportunities came to me. Um, I did a project last year with the PR firm that I interned for in 2012. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. My fellow intern who's been a full-time employee there for like a decade. Um, she came to a comedy show actually. And then like a couple weeks later, they were pitching a new client and they were like, if we get this project, we're going to need a little help, a little contract help. So she hit me up and was like, we were working on this pitch and we were just talking about you, blah, blah, blah. So that was just like a top of mind thing. And then I'm always a uh, phone call away for 3C communication. So um, Brian Rutberg, that's actually who I'm a dog sitting for right now. He, he'll frequently put me as a consultant and coach in his proposals. And do you still get like a lot of people reaching out to you? Hey, Christina, I need you to do this for me or like this is stuff or consulting stuff. Not so much. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of fizzled out. I did the project last or the session last week. Um, so that's somebody who's been kind of keeping up with me, you know, over the years, but yeah, I'm sure I could spark that all up again, but it's, it's funny how, if you stop talking about a thing, like yeah, people will not think about you. So that, that top of mind awareness is, is real. So I'm guessing the answer to the question is no, but is there like a comedy school people can go to to learn comedy? There's all sorts of stuff. Um, the, there's a, Rise Comedy, they do a lot of improv stuff, but they have different workshops, writing workshops, um, and then they do showcases and stuff for their students. So um, I think I've seen more of it on the improv side than the stand-up side, but Second City is is known for, for their programs as well in Chicago. Um, and then there's all sorts of online stuff, different, just like anybody, right? Like, here's my e-course on how to do this or how to do that. Um, there's stuff on, like, there's the art side and writing jokes and then there's the business side how to get booked so i've seen like different workshops and stuff for that but so you know like in hip-hop there's a big thing you know of people like hip-hop or rappers that having ghost writers right mm -hmm. and they kind of like you know you're not a real hip-hop person or you're not a real rap battle person you've got you put some of your, 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 mm -hmm. your raps for you you're like low level is comedians they do the same thing where like if someone has someone writing their jokes they're thought of as like a lesser level as if they like perform and write their own jokes I think it's similar, but not as intense. Um, I think with uh, 
yeah, with rapping, I think it, it's a little bit more of like, or maybe that's just the culture of rap. I don't know. Uh, in hip hop in general. Um, but yeah, with comedy, like there's, I don't know. I have, because I have mixed feelings about that in general. Because it's like, well, there's performing and there's doing the thing. You could be an incredible songwriter, but be a shitty singer. So that means you can't be a songwriter now. Like those people don't deserve to be songwriters. Like they need somebody to write for, right? Um, so there's, to me, it's like, it's all just part of the art and it's it's part of the formula. But you, you definitely hear people kind of like, well, they have writers anyway, or they do, you know. Yeah. And so it is kind of scoffed at in a sense, but I don't think it's as intense. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, though, I think the boss know what famous you get. Like you're Dave Chappelle's level, Joe Rogan's level, these top Beck Cat Williams. Like, do we have time to write their own jokes, you know? I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't, you know? Yeah. Maybe I they think, do it. To, to I don't know. Out. People like Dave Chappelle, he's, he's just a philosopher type of comic right like he sits he literally sits down and like will smoke a cigarette and just talk about stuff um i don't think joe rogan's that funny to be honest i don't either right stand up um so maybe he should have somebody write his jokes but he could still use his notoriety and his his skill set of being a good public speaker to and it seems like he does a lot for comedians also right he has a comedy store he brings people on all the time so he just thinks like he's doing a lot for the culture of comedians as far as setting them up and stuff. Yeah, I think um that could be said. I was I don't know a whole whole lot about Joe Rogan. He does have it's called the Comedy Mothership, which yeah. is the comedy club and um Kill Tony is yeah. is filmed there and, and produced there. And uh yeah. that Kill, Kill Tony killed at the Tom Brady roast too. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so that show in itself, right, it's a panel of comedians who are at that level, right? And Sam Talent, who's from Denver, is now, you know, one of the guest hosts on there sometimes. Um, And there's been, I can think of three comedians off the top of my head that I know personally who've got their name pulled to be on Kill Tony. So uh, in that regard, like, yeah, that one show right there, right, like every week or every however often they do it is giving 10 plus comedians a stage, right? So, yeah, in that sense um definitely he and just his platform too like his his uh podcast so yeah. there's a a lot of a lot of comedy stuff out there though that's like a, a level under right that like so it, many times i don't know who these people are yeah. either so hey, Tony, he came kind of came out of nowhere right because i had no idea who it was until recently i think yeah the the viral clips and stuff have really grown yeah. their their platform in the last few years for sure I was like, now that I think about it, I was like, they kind of did start getting their pop around the time that I really started comedy. So everybody was just like talking about it. Yeah, I like the fact they bring these different people up, like give them like a minute. So one day I saw this clip and it's Kill Tony. He was like, next on the stage coming up, he was like, there's no fucking way this is real. I don't believe this. Next on the stage is RFK Jr. And it was like RFK Jr. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, I... I'll be honest, I've only seen clips. I've never sat down and watched an episode. Yeah. Um, and I've never been to Austin for comedy at all yet. So yeah. my yeah, kill Tony references are clips. It, the three people I know that have been on it. <laughs> yeah, one time it was a uh, Joe Rogan and a uh, Tucker Carlson was on in the little tibber, right? Uh-huh. And uh, this black guy was on the old time remember his name. He said, um, my grandma hates your ass. <laughs> She's gonna be mad at me because I didn't punch you in the face. That's funny. And he was like, Tucker, I, I'm sure your mother, your grandma's just so grown. Hell no, she's not. That's she hates funny. you. I feel like, oh, who was that? Yeah, I feel like I saw that. That one was good. Um, Dr. Phil was on the one that one of my buddies was on. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Like, why is Dr. Phil on? Yeah. Um, so is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Huh? I know you got to get out of here pretty soon. I don't think so. Nothing in particular. This was fun. I haven't like really sat down and um, the other podcasts I've done recently are like other comedians. Yeah. So like having somebody outside of comedy, yeah. like you got me thinking about some <laughs> things to be on. Like, nice. Maybe I need to ask myself some yeah. questions. Uh, and yeah, other than we talked about like where to find me and all that at underscore C Brennan on all the socials. Uh, followers mean something to somebody. So no, I'll take a follow. YouTube <laughs> subscription, right? Subscribe. Do you have a like, YouTube channel? 
I do. I do. I'm on YouTube. I need to, again, the, this consistency thing with posting, um, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about not burning material. It's like, what am, what do I post? Yeah. You know, do I want to like, who gives a fuck? Like yeah. all the, the number of times somebody's like, you should do a podcast. And I'm just like, bro we don't need another podcast right i'll just come on to your podcast <laughs> like i could just go to jason cabinet's podcast experience um so yeah i don't know i think i'm i'm good at, i usually have like something to promote i, I have this i hashtag promo ho h-e-a-u-x <laughs> um so yeah when in doubt it's like promote something so yeah go to my patreon um talk to me uh support Oh yeah, like Free Brandon Jackson on Facebook. That's the Black Sheep Publishing um Facebook page. And be nice to people. That's yeah. Who am I biting? Who is that? Ellen DeGeneres? <laughs> be kind yeah, today. Yeah, exactly. But then I'm gonna be the meanest person ever and have all these crazy that so, stories come yeah, out. That was so fucking crazy. Like or do you say be kind? You're fucking like destroying destroying your people? Like Yeah. I know. I should come up with like a what do I do all the time that I could I cry all the time, so maybe I'll come. Don't cry. <laughs> so what, cry your eyes. So what are some shows you have coming up, either here in Seattle or Denver, like the next two weeks, the next month, and people can check you out at, check you out on? I'm in Seattle for the next week tonight. This I don't know if this probably won't be out tonight, but uh, Trenchers has a comedy show every Tuesday. I believe it's a free show at 8 p.m. down in Renton. And then this Saturday, the 27th of July, I am at Hop Vine up in Capitol Hill. And then I'll probably be at Club Comedy tomorrow night. Uh, for their open mic nice um hey christina thanks for this again you're such a great person i always like spending time with you i know this was so fun i'm glad we got to to uh well you got to catch up with me yeah yeah <laughs> i'll catch up with you in a second cool all right thanks for listening and remember to be great every day <laughs>